How are we doing, guys? It is another Monday Night Live session of the Watercraft Journal. I am your host. My name is Kevin Shaw. Thank you for tuning in. I am the editor-in-chief of the Watercraft Journal, the world's most popular personal watercraft magazine. We publish new articles written every single day, Monday through Friday, entirely subscription-free to you. There's no downloads. There's no passwords. and There is no secret handshake to get in and read the magazine. And there's no pop-up ads or anything like that either. So if you guys want, if you want the latest news in the personal watercraft industry, you want reviews on personal watercraft, you want event coverage, you want really awesome stuff like that, you've come to the right place. Not only do we have the YouTube channel, which we do entirely free to you, we also publish, like I said, every day, Monday through Friday at www.watercraftjournal.com. If you're only tuning into the YouTube channel, you're getting, I want to say, less than half of what we produce. I want to say you're getting a third of what we do. So definitely do not miss out on checking out the magazine at www.watercraftjournal.com, where we publish new articles entirely subscription free to you. Okay. We are, uh, okay, yeah. All right. We're live. All right. So I, I got a weird alert. A little bit of news before we get into tonight, into tonight's topic, and then I'll get right into it. Um, it. Oh, first and foremost, if you guys have any questions and you need to have it answered live here, a super chat is going to get my is going to get my attention. So super chats can be done in the uh, when you if you if you've subscribed, you can hop in, do a super chat, and I'll answer your question live here on the show. Billy's here, everyone. Billy is here. Everyone, welcome Billy. All right. Very cool. All right. So, upcoming videos, upcoming content. Uh, we have our, Kawas our 2023 Kawasaki Ultra 160 LX review article and video. It is slated for this Friday. Uh, if it is ready sooner, it'll come out sooner. If it uh, needs corrections, I will bump it back because uh, we're pretty meticulous about what we put out. Want to make sure that the script and everything that we put out is correct. So that is slated for this Friday. So look out for that this Friday. Um, as some of you know, I joined the crew at the Great Lakes Ride. And in fact, I'm going to be teasing a little bit of the footage that we got there on tonight's topic and um that was a really great ride i'm waiting on one little clip or i'm wait, or i'm waiting on some clips to come in uh i of course wonderfully lost another gopro and uh lost a whole bunch of really good uh really good coverage so i'm asking for all the guys who had gopros to help me out and supply some content otherwise it'd be a little thin uh, but that video will, will probably, once I get the clip, it takes about a week and a half or so to, to edit that into a video that is worth watching and we'll have that video to you in probably two weeks time. So hang on for that one. Um, uh, a couple guys asked me about the Strapino video that's going to happen eventually. They paid me, but I haven't made good on it. And so I'm a bit of a flake. Um, but I wanted to do something different than just the usual video. Uh, last, I wanted to let everyone know, uh, I teased it last week. And quite frankly, I wanted to push it again, even though they're not paying for this. was, um, And it is very apropos for tonight's topic. Is that we recently brought on Impros to the Watercraft Journal. We are... I am personally very excited to welcome Impros because it, for those who don't know, uh, Glenn, who ran the pretty much ran the watercraft division for Scat Track for 30 years. Uh, I want to say 30 years. Maybe it was a little shy of 30 years. Um, Glenn's a guy who worked with OEs. Guy, he worked with racers. He worked with race teams. He was, he is the prop master. He is the nozzle king. This guy was the dude for Scat Track. And don't get me wrong, there's a phenomenal team at Scat Track, but 
when Scat Track got out of personal watercraft in last December, and we did a little snippet of it, um, revisiting it. The reason we revisited that news of Scat Track closing its watercraft division was that Glenn went over with all of his experience and bought Impros. Uh, Dave Stewart was looking at getting out of Impros, and Glenn was happy to pick it up. And we are working with Glenn and his daughter Dana. And they have been absolutely fantastic in coming into the Watercraft Journal and knowing what they are bringing to the table and our reach of audience. Guys, I am asking you to be smart and hit up Impros. And when you do, use coupon code WCJ, Watercraft Journal, WCJ10 to save 10% off a brand new impeller a stock replacement impeller, or if you want to send in your damaged impeller or you want to tweak your existing impeller, they will do it. They have a full service center that takes care of existing impellers. If you want to send yours in, they will apply that coupon code to any purchase you make. So save 10%, go over to Impros, who's been around for 30 something years and use an American company with American hands and support American business. They want to keep the Impro's name around. I want to keep the Impro's name around. I don't want people sending their money to freaking China. Keep your money in the U S and get, send your, uh, if you're sending it in to get repitched or repaired or buying a new one, hit up Impro's. That's Impro's.com. I M P R O S dot C O M impros.com and either on the phone or check out digitally use the coupon code wcj10 to save 10 percent off you'll thank me i'm telling you you'll thank me and a lot of you guys by the way by the way a lot of you guys who are trying to find the custom combination for your yamaha cd or cowie especially yamahas who are having cavitation problems out of the hole stop stabbing in the dark Call the guys at Impros. They know it. They know exactly what you need because they're the ones who are supplying all the impellers to all the race teams. And real race teams. We're not talking the freaking Yahoo's out in Florida who are racing out in the ditches. No, we're talking Havasu race teams, guys who go international, guys who are going to Dubai. They're using Glenn's pitches. They're using Glenn's tech. So absolutely jump on this, okay? I am telling you right now, uh, I am projecting, Stephen. This is my inside voice. I have voice of modulation syndrome. But I'm making, a, I'm making a big point. I'm making a very big point. So jump on Impros. Don't, don't miss out on this one. Kev, tell them Kevin sent you. Kevin screamed at you. Whatever the hell you wanted to tell them, they'll, they'll take care of you. All right? Um, okay, so checking off all the news, checking off the Impros announcement. Okay, so um, let's get into it. <clears throat> the first year that the Watercraft Journal started, someone sent me a really funny picture. And it was terrible. It's very tasteless. But it was taken from a cell phone in a repair shop or in a dealership service center. And it was just the bottom of a ski. You can see the intake grate, but folded in half and stuck inside of the intake grate was a full size female duck. And it was dead, clearly. And it just was folded in half and stuck inside. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's terrible. And um, I put it on our Instagram page. And I got a very prompt email from Yamaha saying, take that down. What the hell is wrong with you? So, yeah. Um, and all I wrote on there was uh, jet pumps suck was was the joke. And Yamaha was not none too happy with me then. And they're none too happy with me now. And so nothing really changes. Um, but... That was something really funny, and I always got a laugh at it. And, that, and, and it's funny because it's part of the nature of these machines. 
that's how a jet pump operates. Okay. It sucks water in, it processes it, compresses it, uses it, it tra- translates it into thrust and pushes it out the nozzle. That's it. Okay. It is a pump. And um, for whatever reason, a lot of people that seems to escape them and they wonder why they suck up rocks, why they suck up weeds and grass and any other debris in the water. It's beyond me. All right. It's absolutely beyond me. And people just don't understand the mechanics of how uh, these watercraft quite frankly, operate. And so this is a little bit of handholding. I mean, this is nothing new to a lot of you guys, you know, and um, we're just going to have to walk through some very simple things, okay? Um, What happens, I mean, I I really don't want to break down what's really happening, but as water comes in through the intake grate, it is... The impeller has a sucking motion. It pulls in. So it literally will. And why do why, why do every manual say operate in a minimum of three feet of water? Why does it say operate in a minimum of three feet of water? Because jet pumps produce vacuum. They suck. And they will pull all sorts of detritus off of the floor off of the floor of the ocean, the river, the beach you're on, wherever, the lawn tramp for that matter, that's just what's going to happen with these machines. So you have to consider, if I get on the throttle, the more you get on the throttle, the more suction you're creating in that pump, all right? At idle, it's not really pulling a lot of suction. You get on the gas, it pulls real hard, and it starts pulling things. I've seen... I've seen rocks the size of my thumb get pulled up from two two to three feet and get lodged in a pump. It happens. It happens. They create vacuum. All right? Do not be surprised by what junk your jet pump's going to inhale. So operating typically in three feet of water, more often than not, now obviously at the launch ramp, your trailer might be low. You might have really short, you know, 12 inch or 12 or, 12 or 13 inch uh, wheel, wheels on there. Okay. You might not have a lot of ground clearance off of the bottom of your ski. But thankfully, if you've deep launched your trailer enough, the ski is going to buoy up as the trailer goes down. So get your get your ski as deep as you can without losing it before you fire it up and get out of there. This is just safety precaution kind of stuff, okay? Careful about riding through kelp fields, through grassy areas. It will pull grass and kelp, and kelp is very sturdy, all right? A Pacific Ocean kid who grew up in the Pacific Ocean, I have chopped up a lot of kelp, and that stuff is very sturdy, it's very thick, it can, and when pureed, it can gum up and wad up inside of a pump to the point that you have to scrape it out with a putty knife. I'm not joking. That stuff gets gnarly, all right? So be careful of any sort of plant life. Plant life's a big deal, all right? It will get pulled up, it will get sucked up, okay? Third suggestion is... What we didn't pay attention to, what we didn't do on this ride, and that is give it a day or two. Give the day, give your ride a day or two after heavy rainfall. Light rainfall is different. Heavy rainfall washes all sorts of debris into the water. I live in Tennessee. All right. I live on the Cumberland River. The Cumberland River will literally uproot full size trees and root structures. And send them tumbling all the way down the river. I have seen this. I have videoed this. Guys who know me have seen these videos of full trees going down the river. Okay. On our ride through Detroit, I sucked up a big wad of polymer plastic. Where the hell did it come from? Just trash floating in the water. 
And it wasn't on top. It was floating underneath because it was heavy enough to be about three or four inches below the water level. And I pulled it right up. Guess what? It happens to the best of us. Okay. And I'll show you the video just for fun. But heavy rainfall, and I'm talking heavy rainfall. Pay attention to what is, what's getting washed into the water. Okay. Plastic bags. Guy, I, I think of all sorts of just floating plastic debris and trash, uh, especially if you're in a, a if you're in a heavy populated area or a blue state, you're gonna ride through trash. You're gonna ride through trash. Okay. I don't know why, but blue states are always the dirtiest water that I've ever been in. Sorry to make I'm not trying to make it political. I don't know what to tell you. It just happens to be. Every time I ride in a red state, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Uh, sorry to point fingers. All right. So getting but we're going to do some worst case scenarios, but here the tips that I shared are very very basic, all right? Obviously, you can't know what's below the water level at all times. It's very hard to see that, especially if the water is brown, brackish, dark, whatever. Or if it's cold, it might be really hard to see because the water typically is darker when it's colder. Um, or choppy, but I really recommend being keenly aware of your surroundings, having really good, uh, you know, uh, situational awareness. Look at what you'll see drifts of debris. You'll see flotsam and you'll see all sorts of jetsam floating around. Try to avoid that. If you can make big sweeps just to get around it. Okay. Uh, now I think some guys who do a lot of riding will probably argue with me. If you are riding in a group, um, if you are riding in a group and you're kind of stuck going through maybe some flotsam and you're kind of like, crap, what do I do? I know guys who are like, go slow through it. I don't recommend that. I say go through it as fast as humanly possible if you're if you literally have no choice. If you are absolutely nailed to a tree, I mean you're just stuck. You're flanked on either side and you just see a current of trash in front of you. I err on going fast. Here's why I err on going fast. Um A, you're gonna kick up a bigger roost. All right. You're gonna you're gonna move stuff out of your way a lot better than going slow. B, if it's small stuff, you're going to, that impeller is going to grind it up and spit it out really fast. Hopefully, hopefully. This is, this, these are not hundred percent. These tips are not hundred percent. But um, the next thing I suggest is if you can and you're, and you got enough time, but you're stuck, Trim it down because if you trim up, when you trim up, basically you are exposing that intake grate as much as you can. If you trim down, that bow is going to bow spray. It's not perfect. It's not perfect advice, but it is kind of last minute. So that's what I, that, that's really what I suggest for those, you know, those situations. Now let's talk about you've you've clearly sucked something up into your pump. Let's just assume you have sucked something into your pump. You can hear your engine going, or you can hear the impeller going, and it's, it's grinding. Um, it's grinding. It's, uh, you know, your engine's tacking, but you're not getting the, you're not getting the speed, but it's spinning. If you can't tell that you've sucked up something in your, in your pump, but you have, whether it's rocks or weeds or plastic or anything like that, um, you need to be a little bit more attentive because that's how impellers get destroyed. And that's how damage to engines happens. Pay attention. You should be able to feel by your, the feel underneath your seat, uh, on your, on your, underneath your butt, underneath your feet, 
in the handlebars. There's a harmonic. There's a vibration. The engine, you know, the ski's not going as fast, but you've got it throttled out. You'll be, you should be able to know. You should. And if you tell me, how do I know? I think I told you. I don't know how else to, <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. And there might be someone else who will be able to describe it better. So, with all that, um, let's just presume that you have sucked up a piece of wood, a uh, rock, chunk of plastic, something to that effect. All right. People will like to say, hit the, re hit the reverse and try to flush it out. Usually what that does first is I'm not talking IDF. I'm talking just traditional you know, IBR or Kawasaki or whatever. The people who say hit reverse and do that, it's not perfect. I am I tend to kill the engine immediately because I don't want to burn things up. Steven, exactly. Turn it off. Turn it off. I'm a big believer in kill it. Now, what might work is turn it off, let it sit, fire it up again, and it might kick it out. If it's still there, I really suggest you get it out of the water. Okay. The guy, here's why a lot of people just go, oh, just hit the reverse and try to try to circulate it. What the science is or what the idea is behind that is that you are creating turbulence. All right. The, the jet pump is sucking. It's creating thrust. The reverse bucket is down. So it's shooting that. It's shooting that water straight down or to the sides or both. And it circulates. And, it, and you're trying to agitate it out. I've had luck with that as long as it's really not locking up. If it's really not grinding up. And if you hear metal on metal, or if you hear really bad grinding, don't do this. But if it's like a chunk, if it's kind of a soft grind, if it's a little bit of a soft resistance, trying to agitate it out by using the reverse bucket, having reverse deployed and really giving it some throttle can render positive results. It's kind of 40%, 50%. But let's move on. IBR, or not IBR, that's the brake system. IDF, all right. C Do's IDF is unique. And here's why it's unique is that it literally reverses the impeller right, rotation. It literally now not, not fast, it only gives it a couple thousand RPM. Doesn't go fast. You won't go full throttle. But um it will reverse that impeller. And in reversing that impeller, it does a couple things. If you have something soft in the in the impeller, it could, not promised, it could wind it out. It could corkscrew it back out and push it out of the, the intake rate. How they advertise it as being predominantly useful is in uh, long grass and kelp with soft, vegetation all right with vegetation and that's why they're trying to push it out with vegetation and that's really the purpose of idf um you're not going to see c do advertise idf with a guy with a whole bunch of rocks ground up inside of his pump and going hey look blah, and it spits all the pumps up it's not going to do that it, it just won't do that so um all that being said IDF, for those who have it, will work way better than just doing the reverse agitation thing. But if you have a really stubborn piece of junk stuck in the pump, get that ski. I suggest a launch ramp if you can. If you can get it to a concrete launch ramp or to a concrete shoreline because you might be in a river you know like in a in a municipal river or something like that 
a hard surface is going to be your best bet. All right. Now I have come up on soft beaches. I have come up on rock beaches and found a large rock or a large stone. And I intentionally pull up on. A, let me start by saying always ride with people. Can we just put that one out there? Crap always seems to go wrong when you ride solo. Can we just, you know, agree to ride with at least a buddy? <laughs> can we can we do that? Just err on the side of caution there. Okay, great. So, um, I, I'm not I, listen. Concrete, yeah, Benjamin, yeah. You want to know why? I'm talking your ride plate. You're addressing not the bow. I want you to walk up to a hard beach or a hard surface, pump first with your buddy, lift up on the back and get that pump, the entire pump, ride plate and all, out of the water. Get it out of the water. All right? You want that thing completely butt up, stink bugging out of the water. If you got to find a big rock and keep it there and put it on a flat rock so that the ride plate and the pump are completely out of the water, so be it. All right? So be it. That's what you got to do. But right now, you're on the side of the highway changing a flat tire. Let's just come to terms with this. All right? Let's come to terms with this. You're fixing a flat tire on the side of a busy highway. This is not an ideal situation. All right. And you're going to have to be a big boy and pull up your big boy pants and take care of this. I'm I'm trying to help you guys be equipped with knowledge on how to triage this situation. So work with me on this one. All right. So um, one thing I have for you, one thing that I got to explain is that in my 17 years, eight, 17 years? Yeah, 17 years of being in this industry, I have yet to encounter one tool that will allow you to solve your problem without getting in the water. Understand me. I have ridden with people who are so deathly afraid of getting in the water I mean, deathly afraid for whatever reason. I don't care if it's three feet deep. They're horrified with the idea of getting in the water. I'm like, you picked the wrong toy. Go get a side-by-side -side and go to the sand dunes. All right? You're going to get in the water. That's it. You're going to get, you're, you're going to have to get in the water to change this, to fix this problem. So let's just move on. So, that being said, your pump is now out of the water. Your ride plate, your ski is sitting on the ride plate on top of something. Whether it is a driveway, a lawn tramp, I said driveway, a lawn tramp, a large rock, or a rocky surface, all right? A hard surface, not a sandy surface, a hard surface, all right? You want that ski out of there. You could do it in the mud. You could do it in the sand, but it's going to make your life excruciatingly harder. So I'm trying to help you guys out by telling you, find a, a hard surface. And with that, get a flashlight out. Get a flashlight out and observe the situation. All right. Take a good look at the situation. Let me pull up. I'm going to pull up two video clips here. Because I want you guys to see. All right, here we go. Let me bring this one up. I'm going to show you what we went through. Now, you'll see I'm on the launch ramp here. All right, let's see here. Um, stop screen, present, share screen, window. Here we go. I'm going to share this one. 
And we are going to go over here. And I'm going to go ahead and push play. I don't know if you can see that. Nice piece of white plastic in there. Yeah. It almost looks like sea do wear ring stuck in there. So that is the white plastic that I sucked up into my pump. Now, you'll see, all right, you can see, now let me use a little mouse over, over here. I'm using my cursor. It is between the impeller and the blades of the Venturi. All right? So it is not easily accessible, and it's deep in there. So the only way for me to access this piece of plastic was to remove the steering nozzle and the Venturi, pull those out so that I could reach in and grab whatever that was, and it turned out it was a piece of plastic. So let me close this one out, and I'll show you what we did here just for fun. Share screen, window, video, and here we go. Well, it's been about an hour. Well, we have a service truck. We got pump out. Well, the nozzle, really. We're just putting it all back together again. And uh, here is our souvenir of what we pulled out. So yeah, that was a nice piece of uh, mylar that we. Uh, good times, good times. Yeah. And so let me explain what's happening here because a lot of you guys are like, "Wait a minute! I thought you were on the shore." Yes, I was on the shore. All right, we were right here on the launch ramp, and the guys with the Great Lakes, right? The Great Lake Riders. Um, they had a rescue team driving, uh, following us because we were going, we went 237 miles this day. So they had a support team and the support truck met us at the launch ramp back down. And I was able to pull the ski out, turn it around and pull it up onto the trailer, got us out of the water. So this is cheating. All right. This in our example of, of, an emergency roadside tire change, you know, my example here, this was, um, uh, this was, uh, kind of a ideal situation because we were able to put it up on a trailer and what we did. All right. Well, actually really, really what, yeah. What, what we ended up doing was that, you unhook the you unhook the attachment for the reverse bucket. You do not need to take the reverse bucket off. You're overthinking it. Just unhook the reverse bucket so you can move it freely. All right. Sidu, Yamaha, Cowie, it's all the same. It's an, it has a slide lock on it, pops off. You can move the bucket up and down. Bob's your uncle. You're off to the races. Second, what you needed or what we needed were uh uh, metric socket set and a long extension with a socket wrench. Anyone can bring this. I strongly suggest you bring a metric socket set, a socket wrench, and some long extensions. Long, all right? It doesn't matter if it's a foot long. You need to be able to reach, okay? Now, a lot of us... Um, a lot of us... We were trying to poke it out. We were like trying to reach in there and poke it out. It was in there. All right. That piece of that piece of plastic was in there. It wasn't going anywhere. Despite how motivated we were to poke it out, it was wedged in. We had to pull, we had to pull it out. All right. So we pull the steering. Now we've we've moved the steering bucket. Now we take the nozzle off. Now the neat thing is that the nozzle. Is attached to the Venturi, and it's the same for Sea-Doo, Yamaha, and Cowie. So you could just take four bolts, 
and you could take the venturi you could take the whole venturi with the steering nozzle out but you have the tr you have two cables on either side one that is your steering cable it's got a small little 10 mil bolt that goes through actually it comes up from the bottom well on the cowie it comes up from the bottom which i don't like it should come from the top um and then you're going to have your trim control all right and there're two like steering cables so um we backed those two cables off took the venturi out slipped right out with the bucket one of the guys was holding one of the bucket the bucket up i pulled it out and there was the uh the stator the pump you know with all the blades i said venturi earlier and i really meant the stator and i apologize for that the plastic was stuck in between the blades of the stator and the impeller. My apologies. So it depends on your ski. Trim could be on the side. Trim could be on the top. Trim could be on the bottom. It depends on what your ski is. And um, you'll see it. You'll see it. It's not hard. There's four bolts holding the whole thing together. And there's two cables. Either on top or on the side or on side to side. Or like this, it could be there. Yeah, you'll feel the vibration, guys. I already talked about this. And when I took the Venturi out, we took a set of pliers. We had short, regular pliers. Stuck it in there, grabbed it, and pulled it out. And that was it. You just had to grab onto it and pull it out. Now, in retrospect, because hindsight is twenty twenty, what tools could I have used or what tools could I have brought that would have saved us a whole lot of grief? I went through my toolbox and I realized that I had a few tools that I should have brought. And these are tools that I will bring on future rides. And I'll show you these tools and I'll tell you where to buy them. Harbor Freight. They're cheap. Harbor Freight tools are cheap garbage. But if you oil them down and after, you know, you just clean it up and you oil them down, they'll last you. They will last. Little, they're Pittsburgh brand. All right. Number one, small pry with a poker. You'll be able to hook a lot of stuff and pull it out or be able to poke it through with this guy. Every one of these tools is about... In between five to eight dollars. All right. This guy is kind of a no brainer. This guy is an easy one. Okay. But I suggest bringing this done. This will probably not be the go to, but most people will go to this one because they think they can just poke it through and it'll somehow weasel its way out. If you're with any luck, it'll work. But it's worth having this one. These are the ones that we could have used. These, and it literally says Pittsburgh right there on the handle. These long needle nose pliers have a very small opening. I would have been able to grab them and with any luck, vice it down and pull it out. But we did have to really work on ours to get it out. Okay. Again, I had a hard piece of plastic. A lot of you guys with a piece of wood, what these will do is you'll be able to nibble it, break up the wood, and nibble little pieces out if you have a piece of wood and you can poke the rest of it out either using this or our poker. All right. Again, Harbor Freight, long nose, needle nose pliers. Look how long this is. Not the little ones, the long ones. All right. Always bring a pair of dikes, a pair of cut wire cutters. You might suck up a rope. You might suck up plastic, I mean, plastic line, fishing wire, and you know, fishing line, excuse me. You could pull up a lot of this stuff and a good sharp set of wire cutters of, of just a pair of dikes 
you'll if you wrap something up around your impeller shaft, these guys will cut through fishing net. They'll cut through all sorts of plastic if it's all wrapped up, and you can nibble your way free. You nibble your way to freedom with these guys. Definitely keep a good sharp set of wire cutters or dikes with you. All right, last one. I really liked long reach needle nose vice grips. I'll tell you why. Same, same thing, except for reach. Look at our difference here. All right, got a lot more reach. And you open it up, put some tension on it, really bite down on it you'll be able to pull that sucker right out. This one I think was $14. So, all together, about $28 in tools, 28 bucks. It's a lot cheaper than C-Tow. A lot cheaper than being towed back. Those tools, I think, besides obviously, like I said, socket wrench, metric, none of these are made with standard nuts and bolts anymore. No one makes them in standard. They're all metric. Metric socket wrench, long extension socket wrench, boxed end wrenches, probably smart to do that too. Bring some good tools, especially if you're going on a ride that you might encounter some problems, all right? Really, really basic stuff, guys. You can access your pump. You can access your impeller very easily. And it all goes back together. It really does, all right? That Venturi went right back in. You hand thread the bolts in. Thankfully, we had a service truck who showed up and we had some extra tools and we put a little, bit of, a little bit of blue Loctite, never red, blue Loctite, and just goes right in, tighten them all up. Yeah, you're not going to have your torque wrench. You're not going to be able to torque it to spec. Basically, just gorilla the damn thing before you break it. You're going into aluminum. Do not break your bolt into aluminum. If you do, your day's over. Your day's over. Don't sit there and white knuckle it like, ah! All right, get it in there tight. Get in there tight. Don't try to break the damn thing off. All right. So, with that, don't ride in seaweed, Zen Rock. Avoid it. Will a Riva intake grate get plugged up less with seaweed? No, it's more open. Oh, guy. <laughs> it's like a, it's like you telling kids, like, don't jump off the roof. Well, what if I jump off the roof onto something soft? Don't jump off the roof. Well, what if, uh, what if I landed on like a cat? Don't jump off the roof. Well, what if I had a parachute? Don't jump off the roof. Don't jump off the roof. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Don't touch the stove. It's hot. Well, how hot can the stove be before it burns me? Anyway. Neither, Hunter. Get an FXHO. If you have to ask me, get an HO. If you're asking me, get an HO. You're not ready for supercharged. <laughs> oh, I'm not mad. Trust me, I'm not mad. <laughs> I'm just tired. Um, all right. So let's see here. Uh, oh, don't forget a flashlight, please guys bring a, bring a, a good led flashlight. Yeah. All right. Um, so those tools, it goes back together again. You don't need to bother to bring Loctite. I, it, 
because you don't need to bring a whole mechanic satchel with you. And most of you guys are already scared of like, oh my gosh, what do I do? So I'm going to just say, listen, if you're not the kind of guy who does his own service and you're not the guy who's mechanically inclined, but you're following this to a T and you put it back together again, the same way you took it apart. And I'll tell you what, if you are scared of reassembly, you're like, oh, I don't know where things went. Get your phone out and take pictures every step of the way. Take pictures. Go, okay, I took that one off. That one's over here. This one goes here. This one goes there. This is what it looks like before. This is what it looks like after. Take pictures along the way. And you can delete the pictures when you're done. Take a million pictures. Yeah, Chuck, <laughs> take pictures. Yeah. Take a million pictures. If it if you're uncomfortable and it's unfamiliar territory, which is fine. If it's unfamiliar territory and your guys are sweating it, and I understand a lot of people are like, dude, I, I don't know how to do this. That's fine. But take a whole bunch of pictures. And you'll be able to go step by step. And if it takes you two hours, fine. But you're going to be able to put your ski back together again and you can cruise back home and you go, listen, man, I just want to go back home. Uh, I'm not happy. I'm not happy to be, you know, I'm not, I'm not happy to, you know, you know, I don't want to push it. Okay, fine. Put it back on the trailer, take it to your dealership and say, Hey, listen, here's all the pictures I took. I, I got it home. It's running fine, but I, I took the, I took the bolts out. Can you guys relock tight them? Okay, fine. And have your dealer or whoever you trust, have them put it back together or, redo your work, you know, double check your work. That's fine too. It's okay. No one's going to judge you for it. Okay. In fact, every, most anyone who's worth a damn, who is a good friend is going to applaud you for fixing it going, hell yeah, dude, good for you. You're like, oh yeah, yeah, it was pretty cool. And you'll get more familiar with it. You're like, oh, okay, cool. And that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. So that's really the biggest suggestions I can make. This is not now, mind you, I have seen really bad stuff get lodged in there where you're like, man, I'm going to fight this for a while. All right. I think honestly, 98% of the time you'll be able to free that, that impeller up. I think about 90, 97% of the time, I shouldn't give you that high of a percentage. I'm more comfortable than most people are. But maybe 90% of the time, you'll be able to get whatever it is out of there. All right? You will have to get in the water. You will have to get wet. You will have to be uncomfortable. And your day will be, you know, I mean, we ate up an hour. We ate up an hour fixing mine. And we're all pros. All right? Mm -hmm. We're all seasoned guys. But, yeah, I, I really do recommend that. You take a bunch of pictures, you go slow, watch what you do. As long as you got the tools, you'll be fine. All right. This is a roadside tire change. It's an emergency. All right. That is what I had planned for today. That's literally it. All my notes are. Even with the gators. All right. You guys want to know how you do it with gators? Gators don't want to eat you. Gators are not interested in you. I've had this told to me by several people. Crocodiles are different. Alligators, this is what, like, really salty good old boys out of Florida and Louisiana have informed me. But here's what I suggest. Thank you, Chuck. Here's what I suggest. First, you're doing this on the doing this on the shore. All right. You're you're addressing a problem on the shore. They're not going to come up to you on the shore. They're not interested in you. Okay. But if you suck up a bunch of grass and you're in the water and you are like, you're stuck. Now I've had this happen. I have had this happen to me. All right. Where the water level's low, you're going. I was in the St. John's River. Water level is low, and we just chopped up so much vegetation. We were absolutely just inhaling all of this, this grass, seagrass. So what we did 
was I jumped in the water and we had one guy circle me whose ski was working while I jumped in the water. I had one arm on the gunwale and I reached in and grabbed the grass out of the intake pump or out of the intake rate. Clearly the ski that I am clearing out was not running. Turn off the engine. I know I probably should have started with that, but for me it was obvious, but not a lot of people it would know they were it was obvious. So if your ski is clogged with grass, have your buddy circle you, not fast, just idle, just idle around you. Okay, make that engine is making a lot of noise. It's going blah 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 blah. All right, even if it's a naturally aspirated Yamaha that's getting really good gas mileage, it's still making noise. You jump in and start grabbing grass from underneath the from the intake rate. Okay, if that's the case. Um, the only creatures that I know that. No, water moccasins will not go to noise like that. Now, if you're swimming in the water, a water moccasin will charge you. Um, but, okay, Hunter, you're saying in Canada, we worry about deadheads and moose. Will moose charge you? Moose won't charge you if you're in the water trying to clear out your pump. Yeah. Moose won't come after you. So, um, I think you're in the clear, guys. And if you make noise, you got a ski going around you. I don't care if you're out. Well, no, because the engine makes all sorts of noise. And and I was going to make a joke about South Africa where all the great whites jump out of the water and eat seals. But... Um, the great whites won't even come out, out after the boats unless the boats are chumming. So I think you're in the clear, guys. Of course, you're out in the ocean. Yes, moose kill people on land, but they don't charge after you in the water. This is what we're talking about. If you're antagonizing a moose on the land, I got nothing to say with to say to you. <laughs> go go antagonize a moose. Go right ahead. <laughs> anyway so that's it for tonight i think that was uh tonight's topic um can i use a regular car battery charger on my wave runner yes i do it all the time it's just a standard trickle charger i wouldn't use a jug i wouldn't use a jump a automotive jump box um, there are power sport level jump boxes if you must jump it. I'm trying to fish my bottle cap with my feet. Um, but yeah, a a trickle charger like a like a tender, a battery tender, um, or a C Tech. Those will work fine. Those work fine. Uh, I like the C Tech better uh, personally. You know, wait, I'm a battery tender. I use a battery tender too. I have a SeaTac and I also have a battery tender. So yeah, they'll work. Cranky. Not cranky. I'm fine. I'm good. Okie dokie. Um, yeah, Gunter, I hope uh thank you for the super chat. I hope that answers your question. Chuck, thank you for the support. All right. Do we have any more super chats or am I punching out early? I haven't eaten dinner yet. Maybe that's why people think I'm cranky. Um, all right. Do, 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 do. Okay. Yeah, Henry, I saw your super chat. I'm not, I'm not reading it. There's send $10 to get the long hauler 310LX. Um, okay. So question about the old, uh, 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 for you guys with the ultra deck, um, 
the ultra deck what we have to do in modifying the rack is that we the rack that we have is perfectly me perfectly measured and fabricated to fit that 12 gallon tank that we we sell the kit with the problem is, is that Kawasaki put the runners for its multi-mount kit wider than anybody else in the market. And so if we made little L-shaped brackets that went down and were wide enough to, excuse me, to get little lockers for the multi-mounts, those brackets, I think, if I if I'm not wrong, are like almost three and a half inches each side. It, there, it's so wide. Cowie made it so ridiculously wide that it's kind of not even worth it. So we we've got the measurements, we've got everything kind of laid out. Um, we just don't like. We don't like the design right now. So we're not going to sell something that's not going to break. Or, wow, let me try that again. We're not going to sell something that we think could break. We're not going to sell something that we wouldn't be comfortable beating the living snot out of. So if I'm not happy with the build quality and the design of the rack, I'm not selling it. I'm just not going to. All right. Um, I've shown people that you can literally pick up the back of your ski using uh, our rack when it's properly connected. Um, and I strapped. <clears throat> I had I had it strapped down using ratchet straps, and it kind of beat up the plastic. Um, I'm just not happy with it. I, I just. I don't want to sell that to people knowing that it'll probably hurt their hurt, hurt the plastic um, ultra deck. And so I just, I can't sell an inferior product. I'm just not going to do it. So um, are you going to do any reviews on any of the crash products, particularly the predator with the super jet going four stroke? No, I don't have any, um, I have a good relationship with the guys at Crash. Um, I've known them for years. Crash advertised with us when they were first starting to try to get into the States. Um, I've known Nick for a long time, Nick Barton. Uh, I just don't have any access to them. If they want to put me on one, that'd be great. But I really just don't have one. So uh, right now, I just don't have any access, Eric, to any of the Crash skis. Um, I like to ride the, the single seat predator They're you know, they're, they're blaster. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Um, I just haven't had my hands on one is 700. Okay. Henry's got a super chat is $7,800 for a 2011 SXR fair, uh, fair and really good condition guys, 7,800 bucks, dude, buy it right now. Oh my gosh, buy that right now. Dude, they're going for nine grand beaten up. My brother wants, my brother and I want to get one. My brother wants one. I want one. I think the SXR 800 is one of the best ones. Um, I would absolutely jump on that for $7,800. I would absolutely jump on it. Yeah, I would absolutely jump on that, Henry. All right. Um... I think you have to put them together. They come as kits. Uh, the crash? No, there's guys who will sell you a turnkey crash and a harpy. Um, yeah, turnkey. They have their own two stroke engines too. Um, really cool. Fuel injected. Really bitching stuff. Question, is the footwell bag for the Superjet good? I want to put my phone in it with the waterproof case. Oh, the one that tabs on? the Like the, the little storage pouch? Yeah, I had my phone in there in a waterproof case. 
I mean, I wasn't jumping surf. I was goofing off on a lake, but I had it in there all day. It was great. Uh, any special advice if you have to ride alone? Don't. I do ride alone, but don't. Uh, if you do, make sure you're in cell phone coverage area. If you are not in cell phone coverage area, make sure that you have emergency contact. Someone knows that you're going out. Your wife, your girlfriend, your kid, whomever. Next to kin, that they know you're going out. That you have a set return time. So they're like, dad's been gone for nine hours. Okay. So uh, gun answering Gunter's question. Um, let's see. What else? Uh, yeah, if you're within cell phone coverage and your cell phone is charged or your ski has a charger and it is constantly charged and you can get a GPS signal, you can make your way home or you're stuck somewhere. If you have cell phone coverage, and don't presume you have cell phone coverage, be really keenly aware if you do or do not. Um, I've been in areas that suddenly have blackout areas, and you're like, why is there no signal here? Um, and I get spooked. I, I get spooked because I'm like, I'm riding alone. I'm disobeying my own advice. Have you tried the new Spark Evo Jet? I have not. I've wanted to. They look cool. They look like they look like a cool go kart. They look like a lot of fun. All right, we're at an hour. I think we're good. Uh, I don't see any more super chats, and so I'm gonna punch out, guys. Thank you very much for tuning in. This was a lot of fun. And uh, again, take advantage of the impros, uh, the impros deal, because. Chances are you guys have blunted some of the blades of your impellers and you've wanted them repaired. Um, you can save 10 per, you can save 10% off and have it done by a pro. And if you've done any modifications or if you want it tweaked a little bit, the the pro, these guys will do it. M pros will do it. So go and check it out. Again, the coupon code is WCJ10. WCJ10. Um, watercraft journal. If you're on the phone with them, just say, Hey, listen, watercraft journal. All right, guys, this was fun. Thanks again. Thanks for tuning in. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the newsletter at the watercraft journal so you don't miss out on any articles or videos that we publish. We do one newsletter a week every Friday, and that puts all the videos and all the articles in one newsletter. Newsletter is free. You just use an email address. Uh, we don't send out stupid, obnoxious mailers or, you know, uh, spam content. It's literally just the newsletter. All right, guys, have a good night. We'll talk to you soon.